Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Dustin Moffitt here. I am a naturopathic doctor and the medical director of our Hayes, Kansas location. Um, this is a three-part series in which this is our final installment. Uh, the first few series in the, the uh, talks have been prevention and real health. Second one was followed up by maintaining wellness. And this third and final one we will be talking about addressing root causes. So if you have any questions or comments or anything that you want to add in, um, please go ahead and comment on our YouTube video. You can see the stream is live now. Uh, if you're watching this recording, of course, there's not going to be a live feed. Um, so this will uh, not contain any direct medical advice. If you would like some of that, please feel free to schedule an appointment with either of our, our docs. Uh, other than that, I will try to keep an eye out for your questions as we go, and I'll try to get to them as I can, or we'll just kind of put them in at the end. So the talk today is all about addressing root causes. And the last few times, so like I said, the, the first one was all about real health and um, what aspects that we can go to. If you're curious about we talk, what we talked about with that and you missed some of that, please go to our YouTube um, channel. So it's just youtube.com and Reardon Clinic, and you'll be able to see the series called Making Your Health Span Match Your Lifespan. Uh, the second one, we talked all about maintaining wellness. And in a very quick little excerpt, um, there were four main categories, health, happiness, wealth, and harmony. And then there were internal and external components to each of those. And you can see uh, kind of there. Same thing, if you'd like further information, please go back and refer to our initial videos. So Dr. Uh, Hugh Reardon, I use this uh, saying for the last talk, but health is having the reserves to do what you need to do and want to do with energy and, and enthusiasm. Um, and that really goes in, in peace with saying what health truly is and health Obviously, if we, we maintain a high level of health, our uh, ability to defend any underlying root causes are always there. So I just felt that was a very good one to, to start with. So symptom management. Uh, symptom management is a lot of what the standard medical society kind of goes after. Um, and it's not just the necessarily at the fault of a doc. Um, it, it's really how insurance system is, is set up to be. Insurance really should be looked at more of anything uh, being a sick care system rather than a healthcare system. And here at the Reardon Clinic, we really try to approach nothing but uh, whole person, whole healthcare. Uh, so symptom management is basically where uh, if you're having headaches, um, we're going to just get down to, to treating your headaches, and most time that, that will include some kind of anti-inflammatory medication or something to stop vasospasms um, or muscular spasms. But does that really fix the reason as to why you're having headaches? Not necessarily. So it's almost like cutting a weed but leaving the roots in the ground. Obviously, that weed is going to come back, correct? Addressing the root causes is where we actually look at finding the root of the problem. Uh, so when we want to stop weeds, we want to remove the entire weed so that it can't come back, or we want to increase uh, nutrition of the ground or uh, put some kind of a weed preventer, whether it be a barrier or mul extra mulch or increasing the thickness of the grass, etc. Obviously, we don't grow grass internally, but these are all just underlying issues of why root causes are the most important aspect that you can do. So the, the first category that we truly like to focus on here at the Reardon Clinic is deficiencies. So if you've got a certain nutrient deficiency or a hormone deficiency or anything of that sort, uh, it's not going to let your body's biochemistry function as it should. So your cells aren't going to be operating at full capacity. Uh, so as you can see in the blue section to the right, uh, when you have proper nutritional balance, oftentimes what we'll see is decreased inflammation, and there are markers that we can use to, to observe those as well. Increased immune response, 
uh, which has been incredibly important anytime in uh, years of pandemics or anything else going on. Um, improved energy levels. Almost everybody that we know of can complain of low energy from time to time. So if you're struggling with that, we can look at underlying reasons as to why that, that's not working. Um, improved resistance to infections, that kind of goes along with that immunity. Better visual acuity and retinal health. So this is really important as we age. Um, and I know some of us can probably relate, you know, uh, as we age, nighttime vision becomes a little bit more challenging. And there are certain nutrients that actually help the cells in the base of the eye respond better to, to light reflectivity. Resilience to stress and promotion of relaxation. I think this last year has been a great example of how our body will adapt to chronic stress that just keeps going on and on. Um, and if we can't change the environment of which we are in and surrounded by stressors, we need to adapt our body or we, we need to change the way our body responds to that stress. And there are multiple things that can be done for that. Same thing, it can be nutrient deficiencies, but we'll get into an, a couple other causes at the uh, closer to the end of this talk. Balanced hormones. Uh, this is something I deal a lot with. So this is one of my specialties are bioidentical hormone replacement and thyroid replacement. So if that is something that you're struggling with, feel free to uh, schedule a consult with us. Detoxification. So we always hear about, especially around the first of the year, um, there's always these companies that are promoting extra detox programs, um, whether it be supplement routines or diet routines, etc. cetera. Uh, detoxification is incredibly important. Do you always need a certain supplement to do that? No, there are diet and lifestyle things that we can do to promote our detoxification. But I would say it is one of the most overlooked things that we are seeing. Um, we, we live in a very toxic world. There are all these newest, greatest chemicals um, that are invented to help us keep things clean or to help us produce greater uh, crops. But at the same point in time, our body is not meant to be exposed to these on a continuous basis. So our bodies are becoming overwhelmed. Smoother skin. Uh, so actinic keratosis uh, or people that struggle with pitting scars on their face or a lot of oily skin or acne, sometimes that can be a, a certain nutrient deficiency such as uh, vitamin A because vitamin A is responsible for helping our body slough off some of those dead skin cells. Uh, so that's where some of those nutrients, now vitamin A is not the only one affected in there, uh, but that is one of the nutrient deficiencies that can lead to a lack of smooth skin. Improved circulation. Our body needs certain nutrients to affect how our blood vessels will vasoconstrict, which means to shut down, or vasodilate, which means to open up. And with that, it helps our body act with a different pumping mechanism. So if we don't have the certain nutrients to allow that capability, we're going to see uh, conditions such as peripheral vascular disease, which is very common with any kind of a, a heart disease condition or diabetes. Um, so as you can see, this is only a baseline um, approach to, to why addressing nutrient deficiencies is very, very important. Um, we can take all the things under the sun that we know are good for this condition or this condition, but at the end of the day, the way to address the root cause is identify the known deficiency. So the most important nutrient that you need is the one that, that you don't have. And the only way to truly tell what you don't have is through a nutritional analysis. Toxin removal. So this is where we were talking about detoxification. Uh, we are surrounded by chemicals, heavy metals, cleaning product products, fragrances, um, dust and dander in homes. So a way that we remove toxins, and I'm gonna go through several different ones. These won't always work for every individual, but with toxin removals in daily life. So if you want a very clean looking, beautiful yard with no weeds, one of the best ways to do that without toxins, such as weed preventers, 
would be to get out there daily or weekly and pick through your your um, lawn and remove those by hand by increasing the thickness of your grass or getting rid of grass and planting more flowering species. These are ways to reduce toxins um, in your yard. For in your home, keeping your sheets and laundry uh, clean can reduce all that dust and dander, especially for those that struggle with, with allergies. Keeping up with changing your filter system in your whole house uh, heater or air conditioner, making sure there's no mold. Um, if your uh, vents have not been cleaned in a while, you can always hire somebody to do that or do it yourself. Um, if you truly struggle with allergies, getting such as a HEPA filter system or treating your house on occasion with a um, commercial ozone machine or an ionizing machine. You got to be careful with those. Some people can be very sensitive to that. And you, of course, never want to run a uh, ozone machine or ionizer in the house, especially if you can smell it, because uh, it can be too harsh for, for living substances such as pets, people, or even plants. Um, if you have a lot of carpet or soft materials in the home and you're not keeping those clean enough, those can collect dust over the time. Um, so I personally in my house have wood floors everywhere and that is one way to reduce exposure because uh, if any of you have wood or tile floors out there, you know that they, they can show dirt quite quickly. Uh, but at the same point in time, a lot of the times all that dirt is still there when you've got the carpet, it's just settling down into it. Um, and carpets are treated with, with a boron solution to actually make them a fire preventative. But um, same thing, excessive amounts of boron exposure can be very toxic to our body. Um, toxin removal. Uh, in, in one very overlooked one is a lot of us live, live in cities or some of us live on in the county with well water. Water is one of our most vital nutrients and if you are not filtering your water or you have toxic water and we, we have same thing, all these chemicals in our system, they go back into our water stream or pharmaceuticals. They, they've tested that. They go back into the water stream. Uh, I think that is one of the most overlooked things is that some everybody should be filtering their water before they drink it, uh, even if you're on a city water solution. Uh, so our local water, you know, it, it's pretty hard and they, they treat it with, with chlorine. So it has quite a strong chlorine taste. So by treating your water, you're able to pull a lot of that out of there so that you're not exposed to a chronic chlorine exposure. Um, or if they use fluorides or like I said, eliminating any kind of chemical toxicities, or if you're on well water, sometimes there can be bacterial infections or mold or anything, uh, that can establish itself in there. So if you're on well water system, sometimes you have to go above and beyond um, just a typical filtration system and you might have to add an ultraviolet light system to kill any living substances. Uh, another toxin removal, an easy one. So we know that, as you notice here, Alzheimer's is mentioned. Um, only one trigger that we do know uh, is chronic aluminum exposure. So one thing that I often encourage those that struggle with Alzheimer's type pictures is getting that aluminum out of you. And the best exposure that we know of to easily eliminate is get it out of your deodorants. Um, there are lots of other uh, products on the, on the market that don't have that toxic element into us and they are getting better and better. Uh, some of the more natural deodorants, goodness, uh, they don't always work. So make sure you find one that works for you. Just because one doesn't work doesn't mean that there's not others. Um, ways to improve toxin removal can be uh, treatments such as sauna therapy or just making sure that you're sweating it out, um, eating a very well nutritional balanced diet. Obviously, plants, plant-based uh, foods really help us detoxify the best. Um, but there are other important aspects that can come from, from animal products if that's something that you indulge in. And we'll kind of get into more toxin removals, but I, I think that that is a great starting place um, 
filter your water, make sure you're eating clean food. If you can afford organic, that can be best. But if you can't, uh, there is the environmental working group who puts out a list of products every single year that are called the uh, Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. So Clean 15 meaning that they're shown to have the least amount of pesticides and herbicides on them. So they are considered, you can buy organic or non-organic. Uh, the Dirty Dozen gets updated every single year and it changes a little bit year to year, but you'll see a lot of them that carry over. And those ones um, are ones that absolutely you should be purchasing organic. Gut health. So gut health, I think, is a very, very large overlooked portion of what controls um, our neurotransmitters to make, which are our happy and sad hormones, things that um, help us with our love hormones and our satiety hormones, they, which, which tell us whether or not we're full. Um, they give us endorphins. They do a lot of different things. Um, but also, they produce a very, very large of our immune, part of our immune system. So if the gut health is off, that is always one of my first approaches. Um, and we're, we're going to get real dirty here real quick. Uh, so poop is not talked about enough. It can be an awkward uh, situation to talk to with people. But if you are not having a daily bowel movement every day, or th this can be a problem. So that is one of my first approaches to making sure that patients are detoxifying. So our body likes to detoxify three different ways, primarily poop, pee, and breath. And if you are not breathing properly, that can be an issue. If you are not urinating on a normal basis and having kind of a clear uh, to light yellow color, that's an issue. If you're not having daily bowel movements, this can be an issue. Um, it is not normal to not only have one or two or three bowel movements a week. Um, if you are eating one to three meals a day, which most people are, then ideally you should have be ha having a daily bowel movement. There are different types uh, of stool that can kind of tell you a little bit more and you can always talk to your doctor about that on how to improve that. But if you are not ha having daily bowel movements, I encourage you to reach out to your doctor or a naturopathic doctor or a functional medicine doctor, somebody near you, um, and we, we can help with that too. But get your stools under control. That can be the most important thing for your mental health, for your immune system. Um, and like I said, it's a big part of detoxification. I, I've yet to meet a single patient that when, when their bowel types are more appropriately normal and when they have a daily bowel movement, most of us feel better after bowel movements. So make sure that you're encouraging that aspect in your health. Um, and if you're not, reach out for help. Immune health. So immune system can come from a variety of different things, but if you are not having a uh, proper diet an exercise routine and proper diet, there, there is no one perfect diet. Um, if you're looking for the perfect diet for you, that's where you can work with your local doc or your nutritionist or a health education specialist or something uh, to help line up some kind of a program that works best for you. There are a lot of diets on the, the market um, that can fit a variety of people, but it's never one perfect diet. The best diet I can say is eat a whole foods, ideally somewhat plant-based diet, but getting a variety of different foods. Um, and the more nutritional variety of foods that you have, the more intake of different nutrients you have. Um, and the more colors that you have, the more antioxidants, and all of these together build up to, to help establish our immune system. And as you see at the top here, the IBC now that is one of our IV vitamin C pushes that can give you a, a dose of 7.5 grams very quickly um, over about 5 to 10 minutes. Vitamin C is incredibly important for our immune system, which most people have known. There are products out there that are encouraged um, during times of illness. But the reason why is that vitamin C is a recharging molecule for a lot of our cell pathways. 
And when we are under a chronic stress or we're exposed to chronic um, infections, we've got detox issues, we've got hormone issues, um, all of those deplete vitamin C very quickly. So is vitamin C an end-all, cure-all? No, but can almost everybody benefit from some type of vitamin C? More than likely. Um, so vitamin C is something that is there to make our white blood cells work better. It concentrates in our eyes, like we talked about with uh, poor vision. It concentrates in our adrenal glands. It concentrates in almost all of our white blood cells. Um, so it is utilized in every single um, area in our body to help increase just cellular function and cellular respiration. And we, here with with Reardon Clinic, we are known very well for our vitamin C uh, treatments for any kind of a cancer condition, chronic illnesses, chronic fatigue, etc. cetera. Um, but what that high dose vitamin C does, especially with cancer, is that it helps to reactivate a cellular pathway that is called apoptosis. Apoptosis is a programmed cell death. And uh, it is believed that in a very large majority of cancers, we actually lose the ability of the, those toxic cells or improperly coded cells to die off like they should be. Vitamin C is a way to reestablish that by increasing oxidative stress in those that are poorly functioning cells. But in our healthy cells, it doesn't cause increased oxidative stress because we actually have different enzymes that break that down and can reduce that oxidation very quickly. And that's where it actually charges some of those. Um, so when when you're ever ill, uh, like Dr. Andrew Saul, it, he encourages um, taking vitamin C very frequently when, when you're becoming ill. Um, but Vitamin C also can play a role into inflammation, um, but inflammation is a very, very large problem with every single condition. Um, if you were to track it back, any kind of chronic illness and two main ones that I would say are global pandemics right now are cardiovascular illnesses and any kind of metabolic dysfunctions such as diabetes. Um, I think those are the biggest pandemics that we are dealing with, not only this last year, but overall. And if we were to address a lot of those conditions, I don't know that we would have had as big of an issue as we did over this last year. Um, so increased inflammation is never a good thing. Um, so with that anti-aging aspect, when it comes to inflammation, we know that excessive amount of inflammation can lead to things called um, advanced glyca glycation end products, or AGEs for short, um, named very coincidentally for aging. So the more increased um, AGEs that you have, the more rapidly you are going to be aging. Now there are certain hormones that can play a role into being anti-aging, um, and DHEA is one of those primary ones. It's kind of one of our youth hormones, but it is an adrenal hormone. So same thing with that vitamin C. Remember, uh, vitamin C recharges some of the adrenal glands and it's concentrated there. That is one reason why a nutrient can help our body make more of these things naturally. We don't always have to take these. And there are plenty of foods that are very high in vitamin C. Um, so types of inflammation, some markers that we use here on a typical basis would be homocysteine. Um, which can be a genetic inflammatory marker. Um, when homocysteine is extremely elevated, that usually means that there's some kind of chronic stress and problems with the body dealing with that. But that being said, certain nutrient deficiencies can lead to spiking in, spiking in that homocysteine. HSCRP, or high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, is very specific to our cardiovascular system. And when we have increased oxidative stress in our, our blood vessels, in our heart, um, that's gonna lead to a lot of complications. And that's been seen over this last year um, with, with the um, pandemic illness. Um, so when we see high 
HSCRP, usually that means that there is an, a more immediate stressor of things that we need to affect. Sometimes there can be nutrient deficiencies that, that lead to that. Sometimes it can be hormone issues. Um, sometimes it is basically metabolic backlogging. So where your body's cellular pathways, I almost refer to them like cogwheels. So one cogwheel will turn the next cogwheel and they different sizes will turn at different speeds. Um, but sometimes there can just be a backlog of metabolic waste products that are making that HSCRP go up. It can be a chronic infection that can lead to that. It can be uh, hyperinsulinemia, which we see a lot in diabetic type conditions, whether it be type one or two. Um, and even Alzheimer's has been attributed to almost like a type three diabetes um, as it's more insulin resistance in the brain. And usually insulin resistance comes from excessive insulin production over a given time. Um, some other inflammatory markers that we can track such as um, a histamine. So histamine, most of us think of with allergy production. Uh, and excessive histamine can definitely be a problem, but too low of histamine can be a problem as well. Histamine actually helps our body break down some of our food particles. Um, histamine is also a precursor to our neurotransmitter serotonin. So they all play a role in the kind of regulating that. So just because there is inflammation in the body, it doesn't mean that all of it's bad. We actually need inflammation to stimulate healing. And this is one of my most important things that I talk to about people with chronic usage of anti-inflammatory medications such as um, ibuprofen or aspirin. Tylenol is technically not anti-inflammatory, but it is anti-pain. Um, we need inflammation for healing. Inflammation is the very first part of healing aside from if we've got a cut or anything, um, bleeding needs to occur first for that, that inflammation process to start. Um, but if you are finding that you have a lot of pain and inflammation and you're chronically treating it with anti-inflammatories, that is generally not a good idea. You need to reach out and talk to your doctor um, and, or any kind of a pain treating person such as a physical therapist, a chiropractor, a massage therapist, etc. Um, chronic pain is usually an indicator that something else is going on. If you have chronic pain in one area, that is where uh, one of my specialties is regenerative joint injections, such as dextrose uh, prolotherapy, platelet-rich plasma therapy, and there's also stem cell therapy. All of these are regenerative techniques that help your body to regenerate tissue that is struggling to heal, um, whether it be a chronically inflamed nerve or ligament and tendon laxity. Uh, so basically ligaments and tendons are the rubber bands that hold our bones and our muscles in place. And if those guys become an old loose rubber band, they get floppy, they let things move around too much than more than they should. Or if you tore that and your body put down this big gnarly looking um, scar tissue, Scar tissue can be very, very uh, pain generating. So if you have areas in your body that are just chronically in pain, you need to get those treated instead of just masking those and decreasing that inflammation response because your body may be producing that inflammation locally because there's a problem that never got fixed or by you chronically using those medications it's not allowing your body to get through that first threshold of that inflammation response that stimulates that healing. Um, food allergies can be a big key factor in chronic inflammation. So if you're eating the same food every day, sometimes that can be marking a response that you shouldn't have and it can make your body think it's allergic to it even though it may not be, but let's say that you're allergic to a typical food that you eat every single day and it's inducing inflammation. Um, three of the biggest allergies that we see here are dairy, eggs, and wheat. Um, doesn't mean that everybody is allergic to them, but they are very common and they're very staple foods, not in just America, but becoming worldwide. Um, but 
uh, chronic gut issues. So we have a lot of stool-based analyses. We can do breath analyses. Um, gut health is incredibly important for inflammation. Like I said, our immune system starts in our gut, and it, it's regulating about 80% of that. Our neurotransmitters, which do play a role into pain-type signaling, um, and our hormones can deal with, with chronic pains. But if you've got a gut infection um, or you've seen chronic usage of antibiotics or antifungals or something that you're dealing with chronically, you need to have that addressed because our gut is our first place that we touch food. Um, and if we have leaky gut syndrome, that leaky gut syndrome can cause excessive particles, big, very uh, chunks of food to get through to our blood system. And that's not how it's meant to come in. They should be broken down into nutrients specifically and our body can adapt those. But if we've got these large protein molecules that are leaking through that leaky gut, it basically makes our body be on hyper alert. And that's where we start seeing that increased inflammation because it's, it's trying to figure out where those are coming from and decrease those particles in, in our bloodstream. So sometimes by addressing the gut or your stool, um, that can be a way to just reduce inflammation. Um, and a Dr. Stephen Gundry, now I, yet again, this is one type of a diet. I don't think it's an end all cure all, and it definitely does not fit everybody. It is a very tough diet to go by, but he has a lectin free diet that I often encourage people that struggle with arthritis or excessive inflammation to give a trial period to. Um, to see if that reduces it. And if it does, then that gives you a hint that food-based allergies could be leading to that. But also, you know, a lot of those, those foods recommended on there are prebiotics, which are food for our bacteria to help grow uh, more appropriately. Uh, but food is a staple treatment. Just like our cars run on gas, we run on, on food. So if we don't have the right kind of food or gas or we're depleted, not much is going to go right. Hormone balancing. So this, like I said before, this is one of my specialties. Um, as we age, our hormones naturally will decrease um, over time. Or with women, as they go through perimenopause or menopause, um, what you're doing is you're seeing a rapid decline in estradiol or estrogen and progesterone type hormones, in which case a woman becomes more reliant on androgens, which are more of a male-based hormone, although we both have male and female hormones and there's crossover. Um, so as you age, if you notice that you're not sleeping as well, you're becoming fatigued, you notice joint achiness everywhere, your mood is off, you're getting hot flashes or night sweats, you're losing muscle mass, um, lack of libido, struggling with weight loss or weight gain. Um, sometimes cholesterol and blood sugar can come into that, but usually those are other types of hormones. So just because there are sex hormones, there are a lot of other hormones that, that play a role into this, um, such as thyroid hormones. Thyroid is a gland right at the base of our neck that is responsible for our metabolism, our immune system, our uh, healing ability, it does a lot of different things for us. But what we concentrate on here is we will actually typically look at hormones and thyroid together in which we call a, a panel called the life care panel. Some of our other panels will actually include some of those hormones and thyroid. Um, but if you're struggling with any of those symptoms, especially as you're aging, those are something I highly, highly encourage. Or especially with young men or young ladies, if you're noticing a lot of hormonal imbalances or with ladies when you're first starting or getting close to going through your, your menstrual cycles um, and things aren't quite there or you've got an excessive menstrual flow or you're skipping menstrual cycles here and there, I know they're not always the most fun thing to have, but it is extremely healthy for a lady to have a, month, a regular monthly cycle. Um, but hormones and thyroid play a large role into how our body works. And if those are off, we're, we're not going to see a total balance. So that is something I actually like to concentrate on quite a bit. 
So resetting with sleep. Sleep is an overlooked necessity of life. So just as I said, water is, is a complete necessity. Daily bowel movements can be a necessity. There are a lot of things that compile on top of each other to make our health better. Just because you feel great on five hours right of sleep each night right now, that is not a healthy number. Um, research time and time again has shown that a normal adult, a adult should have about six to eight hours of sleep at minimum. Um, if you're needing above and beyond that to feel recharged, like you're in 10 or 11 hours, yet again, talk with somebody about seeing some underlying causes because that generally is more sleep than is needed. But six to eight hours is approximately what it, what is uh, noted to be the most healthy amount of sleep that somebody needs. Obviously, children, growing children are going to need quite a bit more, especially toddlers or infants. Um, and then teenagers, you might notice an increase in sleep to where they do need that maybe 10 hours of sleep. But there's always going to be situations that are um, proper for anybody. But what I like to encourage is try to go to bed close to the sun set and then rise with the sunrise. Um, our bodies are meant to sleep during the night. That is why you often will start seeing increased health problems in night shift or um, shift workers in general. Um, our, the blue light in our sky, and now we're starting to see research come out about blue light, but the blue light in the sky makes the body more alert. Um, and it makes the, the pineal gland in the brain naturally break down our melatonin, which a lot of people recognize melatonin as a sleep hormone. Um, if you are not getting plenty of sleep, this is one thing to start addressing. And I have to tell a lot of my uh, patients, you know, you're not a teenager. You need to get your butt to bed, right? Um, so make sure you're, you're establishing some type of routine. Obviously, life plays some roles into it. And uh, after having kids, I do stay up just a little bit longer than I used to, uh, just because I want to spend time with my, my wife at the end of the day. But I still try to make sure that I am in bed at least eight hours for sleep. Um, if you have a TV in your room that is highly, highly discouraged, screen time really should not be done close to bedtime, if at all possible. Um, if you are using that, Use some of those blue light filters that are naturally built in to whether your computer or your uh, your smartphone. I've not seen them in TVs, but there are blue light blocking glasses that can be helpful as well. Mental balance. So as we spoke about yet again with that gut health, and we keep seeing trends of things crossing over, right? So there's not one picture perfect thing. Um, we do have two specific uh, profiles that would kind of fit this, the brain uh, profile and the mental health profile. Um, but about 70 to 90 percent of our neurotransmitters come straight from our brain. And as you can see, up to 90 percent of serotonin come from that. Um, so Parkinson's type patients, um, we, we see a de rapid decrease in natural serotonin production, right, as well as dopamine. Uh, so there are parts of the brain that are responsible for, I would say, much more potent levels of serotonin and dopamine. However, at the end of the day, the large majority, so the bulk of it, will actually come from our gut. So in Parkinson's patients, a lot of the times when you start addressing the gut health, you can see you know, some type of improvement. Um, the intestinal Intestinal tract is part of our nervous system, absolutely. If you're not familiar with it, you can always start looking on the internet about your gut-brain axis. So the gut and the brain talk to each other. It's not a one-way pathway. They go back and forth. Um, and there's a lot of crossover about what signals they give. So when our gut bacteria make those neurotransmitters, it's sending that signal up to the brain on other things to do. Um, but also the, the nutrients that we get in through our diet. They go into the brain and feed different parts of that and tell it to, to be more activated. Um, you can directly impact your mood behavior with sleep. Um, and when we have more balanced neurotransmitters and reduced inflammation, that can 
control our anxiety and depression. Same thing if you've got a thyroid imbalance or a hormone imbalance, we'll see anxiety and depression greatly improve when you address those underlying factors. Um, eating certain foods. So dairy is one that, that we can see often be a trigger. Um, but l let's say that you're not dairy and you're something um, obscure such as apples. Uh, and you're eating apples on a consistent basis, and that's producing that excessive histamine production, um, that can induce anxiety or it can induce any kind of inflammatory driving cascade. Um, but if you're eating the wrong foods that are leading to that, that's where we can see that cognitive decline. So actually on an else, a rapidly progressing Alzheimer's patient, um, we saw that so we did a food allergy test because we, we were speculating that it could have been part of it. The food allergy test came back pretty darn good. However, there are actually antibodies to foods, even though you may not be allergic to it. So that's more of an immunoglobulin response, which is just a type of um, cellular reaction marker. Um, but there can be antibodies. And this particular individual had antibodies against their... Um, nerve cells in their brain and it was induced by egg proteins and wheat proteins even though they didn't show that they were allergic to eggs and wheat in this particular case their brain was being attacked because of the egg and wheat products causing that immune response so same, same thing there are very very specialized tests nowadays that can look at underlying factors um, even with, with mental imbalance, we can see chronic viral infections such as Epstein-Barr virus, um, also known as mono, something that would just come and go. It is not the case. We see a lot of rea mono reactivation. Uh, and when you reduce all this uh, oxidative stress on the brain, oftentimes we, we can see mental fog improve, but same thing, hormones play a role into that. Um, but as you see, our neurotransmitters are made from amino acids, vitamins, and minerals. So that is why our real health package is probably one of our most diverse lab packages that we have that looks at vitamins, minerals, amino acids, hormone function, thyroid function. It looks at a lot of those inflammatory markers. Um, that is why we call it the real health. And in our my first uh, piece of the talk on that prevention and real health, I really kind of define what reared in thinks uh, real health entirely encompasses. And look, taking a step back and looking at your real health is the only way to obtain every aspect of health. So I do encourage you to go back to that, that first uh, lecture if you, of this series if you've missed that. Then fatty acids. So fatty acids, Without fat, our, our brain is made of a lot of, of fat, and it is what gives our neurons the insulative factor. Just like our electrical system in our houses and our cars, they have these sheets on them that keep the electrical pathway going through without having any, having any misfires. When we do not have enough essential fatty acids in our, our body, we, our cells don't form as strong of cell walls. Our neurons don't get this nice sheath around them to reduce misfire. Um, so fatty acids are extremely important, and you can get a lot of those through healthy fats in the diet. Um, sometimes if you're under a chronic inflammatory load, we'll need more of those through supplementation. But yet again, it just depends. Oh, stress management. Uh, same thing. We, we all deal with stress on a daily basis, but I think... Um, all of us can relate that stress has been different over the last, last year and a half or so. Um, how you manage stress is incredibly important. If you can't change your stressors around you, let's say that you're stuck in a job that just stresses you out on a daily basis. Maybe it's because of a coworker or because you're, you've lost your joy and drive in, in your job. Um, it, but you financially rely on that job. So you're not necessarily at a place where you can change that job, but can we adapt how we manage that stress from that job? Can you start talking to your HR department about how to better uh, 
cooperate with that. Um, can you find and make a list of daily things that you enjoy about your job? Now, this doesn't always have to be about the job. Um, but can you break down ways to find enjoyment and reduce stress in your life? Um, sometimes just by increasing the amount of sleep that we get, we'll be able to deal with stress more. Or going back to um, kind of those anti-inflammatory medications or anti-pain medications. So if you're excessively using acetaminophen or Tylenol, there have actually been studies that link to that that alters the way our brain processes events, um, especially stressful events, um, or it reduces our empathetic response. So the way that we can adapt to stressors or how we feel. So if you notice that you're using Tylenol or acetaminophen on a chronic basis, you might consider talking to, to a doctor or somebody about getting off of that or finding alternatives because that could be affecting why your body is seeing these increased levels of stress. Or as you age, you notice you're dealing with stress and anxiety more than you used to. Could be a hormone deficiency. Um, or we see a lot of thyroid conditions see, or conditions more um, frequently nowadays. Yet again, it's because high stress environment, low sleep, low lack or lack of proper nutrition or just not absorbing that nutrition. It's not always what you eat, it's what you absorb. Um, but all kinds of different factors can, can be why we have chronic stress. Some ways to address this is obviously get enough sleep, eat a well-balanced diet, get some kind of an exercise routine, um, but also adapting our body to do that. So one of my things that I like to do, it's an exercise routine, but once a week, at least, ideally I'd like to do a little more, um, I do a yoga routine. So I'm not very good at meditation. So when I do yoga, I use it as my meditation to really focus on that point in time and give my body that, that space to, to work on that. Um, it helps me reduce stress. It helps me reduce my joint pain because it's making me more flexible and using muscles that I typically would not on a daily basis. But after every single yoga session, I can always feel my stress levels come down. Um, and today is actually my yoga day. I, I call it touch your toes Tuesday. So, um, same thing, establishing some type of routine to where your body and your mind know together that you have these built in place to, to work on your stressors. Um, sometimes doing a daily journaling can help with stress, talking with your friends, your family, uh, your church group, somebody um, on how to deal with that. But don't just harness things in you. If you have internal stressors, find out a way to get those out so your body at least has some kind of release on that. Um, nature bathing or washing um, or just standing out in grass with an open, uh, with with no shoes on. Um, that, that's called grounding techniques. Those can help some people with stress, but there are multiple different things that can be done to process stress. Okay, so searching for the root causes, we've kind of dipped into some of these, but uh, the best way that I could say is how Reardon providers approach um, any kind of a, a root cause, wellness, um, obtaining real health. So we've created all these different profiles, and a lot of them you will see crossover, and we, we've got a chart on our website that kind of compares each profile if you're um, concern about which one you can be, or if you don't know which one it is, you can always make an appointment and we can really help dive into which one it is. Life care panel, I said, looks at our hormone and thyroid levels. Antioxidant will look at different nutrients um, and known anti antioxidative stress markers that can help reduce that oxidative stress. If you've been diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia, where you notice that you're breaking bones easily or just have a lot of joint pain, bone bone profile has been um, made for that. Brain and mental health profiles, um, those ones have more of the nutrient side. Same thing, sometimes that brain thing can come from increased uh, antibody response, which is a specialized test. 
Sometimes it's a gut response. Um, sometimes it's just hormones. The breast profile, we try to really dial in to be specific to those concerned about any kind of breast health. Energy, energy profile, same thing. If you're fatigued, that'd be a great one. Um, eye profile, if you've been diagnosed with macular degeneration or something of that sort, that would be a great one for you. Foundation profile is kind of an in-betweener. Um, I would say our largest profile that we have is that real health discovery. And even then, that is not entirely encompassing. That's more all about that biochemistry and hormone function and um, inflammatory markers. Mega profile would probably be the next largest, and then down from that would be foundation. And all they do is just take away a few of the different markers and recategorize them to, to make different profiles more cost effective. Um, heart profile, um, obviously, that one's all going to be about heart health, immunity, about uh, immune, immune response. So, how your white blood cells uh, respond to a lot of things. Inflammation, obviously, is going to look at inflammatory markers. Metabolic scoring profile. This is one of our newer ones um, in which we have a metabolic scoring system. Kind of gives you a scorecard of how you're doing on your overall health. And that's something that would give you markers for treatment progression. So you can see, um, let's say that you came in and your metabolic total score was a 60% and 100% is the best. Obviously, that shows a lot of room for improvement. Methylation profile. So methylation dips into some of those genetic type um, markers, or they're, they're called SNPs for short, single nucleotide polymorphisms. SNPs are not necessarily a genetic error. They are a sign of a genetic need. So some people have a greater need and some have lesser need for different things. Um, a main one that is talked about nowadays is a methylation, and I hate to call it an error, but a methylation imbalance. Um, there are certain people that will excessively produce methyl products, and there are people that underproduce methyl products, and that's been attributed to any kind of a attention deficit disorders or attention spectrum disorders. Um, some cancers have been related to it. Some stress has been attributed to it. Um, there are marker genetic markers for how our body processes vitamin D, and that's why you'll see vitamin D need uh, all across the board. Um, the multivitamin and mineral profile is exactly that. It, it looks at, multi, or at vitamins and minerals, and like I said, it may sound like um, it's just about supplements, but it's not true. So all vitamins and minerals are the primary gas source for our cells. And if we are deficient in that, our, our cells are not going to work. I like to describe it like a clock on the wall. So it has those cogwheels, and those cogwheels are those different metabolic pathways. And think of the batteries as the different nutrients to make that clock tick. If you are missing those nutrients, and the only way to truly tell which nutrient you truly need is through, through laboratory assessment. Um, optimal aging profile, obviously, if you notice more rapid uh, aging setting on, that can be one. But same thing with our life care pan, uh, panel. Um, preconception fertility. So if you're struggling with infertility issues, sometimes that can be a hormone issue. Sometimes it can be a nutrient imbalance. That methylation um, issue, uh, like I said, MTHFR has a strong correlation with, with infertility type issues. Uh, Pre-diabetic Pre-diabetes uh, is really just about as severe as diabetes. So if you've been diagnosed with pre-diabetes, it is very, very important to work with somebody on getting that addressed. And a lot of the times pre-diabetes can be corrected through nutritional guidance, um, hormone imbalances, uh, nutrient deficiencies, etc. Prostate profile, obviously if you have concerns of prostate, that would be a great one for you. Um, and then the weight loss profile will just be geared toward those that are trying to lose weight. At the Reardon Clinic, we actually fully believe that laboratory testing is the utmost importance because, like I said, sometimes we can guesstimate, but it's purely a, a clinical guesstimate. The only way to truly know what you need is through laboratory analysis, and sometimes um, 
nutrition is not the only portion of that. So the, those nutrient tests, sometimes we have to add in, like if you have gut concerns and you're not having daily bowel movements um, or you experience excessive amount of gas or bloating or fatigue, that can be um, a gut-based thing. Um, if you have exposure to chemicals or plastics or heavy metals, those can be major sources um, of why you're not getting better. So uh, I see a lot of autoimmune conditions and cancers that they've got some kind of a toxic element that is built up and uh, toxic elements rapidly deplete our body from nutrients. So we're not able to overcome a lot of these things going on. But at the end of the day, laboratory testing is one of the best things. And you can always reach out to your, your doc or reach out to us about uh, scheduling and we, we can work on addressing your true root causes. Um, because if you're just snipping that weed off at the, the ground level, it's always going to want to return. Um, sometimes you can get total remission of any kind of an illness. Sometimes you can make them more stable. Um, every case is going to be different, and that's where your doctor can go over that with you. So that was the end of my talk. Um, so if we have any questions, I'll go ahead and leave the uh, discussion board open for a few more minutes, and I will kind of observe for those that come in. Um, if you're hearing this on audio only, uh, look to the YouTube page, and it's Reardon Clinic, um, and you'll be able to see the, the chat section. So we'll give that a few more minutes here. Otherwise, I do want to thank you all uh, for joining in on this lecture series. And if you've enjoyed this, please let us know in the comment section. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, same thing, do that there. Or if you want to know or recommend a future lecture series by myself or another doc uh, or our physical, uh, I mean, our um, PA, if you would like any of them to do lecture series, please let us know. Um, we are always here to help you guys learn and grow and really generate your true real health. All right. So we'll give it one more minute before we go ahead and close out. But right now I'm not seeing any uh, questions. And like I said, if you've missed any of these series, please go back and look at those. Share them with your friends. Um, and let, let's really reach out and see if we can't get a global pandemic of real health going on um, because health becomes more important um, with each passing year. All right. Thank you, Critical Mass. I, I appreciate that, and I hope you have a, a good day and night as well. All right, guys, I am going to go ahead and end this series, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.